today's topic, more and more people are talking about the wave of new innovation in hearing devices, um, emerging hearing uh, hearables and different types of um, ways to address the unmet need of our clients. So some people are questioning what does it mean for audiology? Uh, what opportunities are out there and is this setting the scene for um, the foundation for augmented audio, augmented reality of the future? So Soundbites today invent, uh, invited experts in the field on the panel to share their views on where we're heading in the future of hearing tech. Introducing our first panelist, Dr. Brent Edwards, is the Director of National Acoustic Laboratories. For over 22 years, he headed research at major hearing aid companies and at Silicon Valley startups. Um, and they've developed innovative technologies and clinical tools used worldwide. Dr. Edwards is a fellow of the Acoustical Society of America and adjunct professor at Macquarie University. So on the screen, you can see, you can see Brent and um, I've read out our director's bio so many times and I'm still impressed with the amount of expertise and influence he has built in our industry. And our guest panelist today is a serial entrepreneur who has developed a thorough knowledge of the global technology and innovation marketplace during his 25 year executive career. Um, he co-founded and is the CEO of New Hera. We welcome Justin Miller to Soundbites. Um, and New Hera is a uh, global leader in smart personal hearing devices, which changes people's lives by enhancing the power to hear. New Hera has developed proprietary and multifunctional intelligent hearing technology that augments a person's hearing and facilitates cable-free connection to smart devices. So Brent and Justin, our audience today has a mix of clinical experts and technology gurus, um, and we're curious about what you do. So perhaps if you could describe your organization and what role does innovation play in your organization? Sure, so maybe I'll go first. Um, thanks, Xiaoyan and Justin, uh, great, great to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the National Acoustic Laboratories are, are now, as, as we call it, we are a research uh, center focused on hearing loss. Our mission is to help people who have hearing loss and improve their lives. So we do this in a number of ways through research by providing uh, advice to government on hearing health care. We develop our own technologies and we help other companies uh, develop solutions for people with hearing loss. Innovation is a big part of what we do. You know, we apply innovation methodologies, lean startup principles, design thinking, agile, and all of that. And but we we really certainly in Australia want to be the, the focal point for everyone who's wants to help people with hearing loss. And I think we also do that for people worldwide uh, as well. Justin, let's hear about you and New Hero. Yeah, thanks, Brent, and uh, thanks for thanks for having me on uh, on Soundbites. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure, obviously, uh, to talk about uh, not just us but our association with now. And you hear, I think, was a good introduction. Uh, we're here to, uh, I, I guess, create a, a a new category of hearing. Um, we've been driving that for about six years, and uh, for us, it's uh, and I'm wearing them today. Is uh, is our probably our latest product, which is IQ Buds Two Max. And the, this is a product that uh, that's been deemed a hearable, and hearable in the category. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that today as to what that means to to, to hearing healthcare. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're very proud to be here and uh, excited by uh, by what's happening in uh, in the hearing healthcare market and the hearing technology market. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited about what we can talk about today. Well, and congratulations on um, winning are being awarded by Time Magazine, one of the top 100 inventions of the year. Uh, really uh, one of many accomplishments that I know that uh, your organization has has uh, accumulated over the past several years. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. It was uh, it was pretty significant recognition, actually, for, for a, a company out of Australia to be recognized as one of the 100 best innovations. But I think more importantly, it was recognition of, uh, of this new categorization of hearing and, uh, and that hearing is uh, is really now becoming a subset of the technology market. And I think that's 
that's the exciting thing for us. It's uh, hearing is not something that that's, that's out there and is an outlier to everything else now. Hearing hearing is really firmly a part of the the broader technology market, and uh, to to be able to be recognised that way, I think is is really exciting for us. So you know, speaking of the hearing the hearing market, you know, how do you think about your market segment and who's a, who's an ideal customer for Nuhira? That's uh, it's a good question. I mean, when we when uh, my co-founder and I, David Cannington, set on this, set about on this journey sort of uh, six years ago, we always had this focus of trying to cater to a market that we we saw was relatively underserviced, which was that mild to moderate hearing challenge sort of market, um, where people were traditionally not doing a lot about um, their hearing health. Um, you know, we all, we've all seen the statistics: the average age of hearing aids, uh, hearing aid wearer is 72. The average age of, uh, you know, we, we start to lose our hearing from age perspective is 35. So we set about what, what could we possibly do to, to try and cater to that market? And uh, um, so the average age of our customers example now is, is, is between the 40 and 50 mark. And, and that's in the sweet spot. So that's where we, we targeted the products to be multifunctional, to be more accessible, more affordable. Um, and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about that today as well. Um, but to cater to that particular part of the market that, that wasn't necessarily being serviced by um, the traditional hearing market. So, you know, I think one of the things that to me seems unique about New Hera is, is you've spent a lot of time thinking about people, say, with that mild hearing loss uh, category. Um, you actually worked with us uh, a couple years ago on testing a, a hearing, basically a hearing test on an app. Which I think is now a part of the app that you get if you if you get into Hero device. And what we found, we compared your app to a, a proper audiologically uh, driven Houston Westlake audiogram, and and found, you know, yours was as, as good as as a clinically uh, driven audiogram at the four frequencies that we tested. Correlation coefficients of something like 0.98. And I if you, I think you're the only sort of hearable device, non hearing it device that incorporates NAL NL2 fitting prescription. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it seems like you're you're focused a little bit more on people who have emerging hearing loss than some of the other hearable companies that uh, I see out there on the market. Is that a part of your driving your underlying philosophy, or is that just one part of the market segment that you're looking to capture? Oh no, that that that's our philosophy. I mean, uh, and and you you can see just in a nutshell um, identified our, our relationships and how important you hear his relationship is with now and uh, and vice versa it's been it's been critical to actually target this part of the market so no I mean when, when we started this journey hear, hearables weren't necessarily defined I mean it was a wearable market and hearing wasn't even a part of that market so um, so no the hearable market and identifying and, and, and targeting um, that that Part of the market as as a hearing hearable, <laughs> I know that's a bit of a, a bit of a mouthful, but we we've always been focused on solving that particular end of the market. But what we've learned over through products and through the developments, um, as you as you just highlighted, was that we needed to make things easier for the user. So we had to embed a lot of that technology. Um, now NL2 is being uh, transformational for our product. Um, that the the hearing assessment, which we've had clinically validated again incredibly important to the personalization aspect of, of hearing. Um, so, so for us, they were, they were key elements that we needed to solve in order to, to, uh, to um, get the product out there and, and ultimately create a, a new category that would, that would service this part of the market. And uh, so, yeah, it's uh, been incredible for us. So I'd, back to you, is there a, is there a potentially a now NL3 uh, on the horizon? <laughs> so, you know, we, we've definitely talked about that, and I think there's an opportunity for uh, an improved fitting prescription. Uh, it's just when, when I look at the effort that went into NL1 and NL2, um, it, it was quite significant. So it's a matter of us dedicating the resources, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if that comes along and, you know, maybe we would partner with you uh, to help us develop it. Um, you know, one, one, one thing that you just said makes me think um, people get confused. I, I talk a lot to audiologists about how hearables and OTC hearing aids and audiology fit hearing aids all fit together. Are they competing for the same customer? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, definitely not. Um, and there, there is a there is an absolute place for audiology 
hearing aids and the like. Um, all, we're, all we're attempting to do is to, uh, as I said, enter a part of the market and create more accessibility and affordability and, and multifunctionality in, in products. And uh, But I think that the, the hearing widget itself is only one aspect of actually tackling that market. So I know there's a lot of talk about OTC and ultimately where that goes, but but I can tell you now, it, it's not just about the widget. So you, you can't put a hearing widget on a shelf, on a peg in a store and expect that it's gonna walk out the door. There's, there's a whole, um, and, and we've been in hearing retail now with some of the biggest retailers know to man for you know uh, five plus years. So we've learned a lot about what it means to be in hearing retail. And I think that these are some of the things that have to be solved in the whole OTC story. So it's not just about the hearing widgets, it's about how you go, how you reach that customer. Because being quite frank about it, no one goes shopping for hearing. And, and that's something that you have to solve if you're going to put an OTC product into market. Yeah, you know, part of how I think about it is, there's a, you know, we talk in Australia, there's 3.6 million people with hearing loss in the US, you know, 38 million, depending on the stats you use. But you know, it, a vastly underserved mar market as suggested by some people, and, and I argue that it's not underserved, that a large proportion of the market doesn't want and doesn't need a hearing aid, uh, and that different groups have different needs. And so we think about OTC or we think about your product, it's it's not either a hearing aid or you know a new Hera or an OTC. There's different groups for each of those products. And I think from what I'm hearing, the very fact that you have a younger demographic getting your product immediately tells you that it's a it's a different group of people uh, with different needs. Now, part of part of what what I argue is um, it's not just about price and accessibility that is keeping people from getting hearing aids. And the converse of that is it's not just your lower price and your accessibility in retail stores that is sort of making you appealing to consumers. Do you do you buy that argument or do you think your your price and and your placement in retail actually is a, a competitive advantage there? Uh, I, I think they are um, competitive advantages for our part of the market. And, and that's that's the important thing to highlight is that is our hearing buds are probably something you're going to have before you go to a hearing aid, right? So, um, so we always envisage that, yeah, we will get a younger audience um, and be more appealing to that younger audience. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, we, we, we bought wireless to market before, but Apple have done such a fantastic job in normalizing having things in your ears. And, and I think that's, that's, the, that's the transformational change that we've seen, particularly over the last couple of years, is that there is a normalization of having things in your ears now. And I, I can't underestimate the importance of that and, and, and how that's leading to us being able to, you know, put some hearing functionality into the buds because people are more accepting around the fact that um, I'm looking like everyone else. And so I think accessibility and affordability are two critical aspects, but I do agree with you. There are so many other things on so many different levels that are contributing to the drive um, and adoption of, of products in in the hearables type space. Yeah, yeah, and and I think some of the problems that you're solving, you know, in terms of stigma, you know, I think your devices for certain people are a lot more appealing than than hearing aids, regardless of whether you could afford both. You know, you're providing additional functionality that might be appealing, and and it's easier access, right? So uh, for a traditional hearing aid, the path to getting a hearing aid uh, takes more effort. It's not that there aren't audiologists around. It's just it takes a lot more work, and some people don't want to put put the effort into it. And so, with your app, with your your sort of one size fits most solution, you know, it, it's it can be be quite appealing for people who don't want to again go through that effort for a traditional device. Yeah, I agree. Um, but again, we're a situational product, Brent. We're not yeah. we're not designed right. to be worn all day, and right. and that's one of the biggest areas of differentiation we have between what we do and what a hearing aid does so our belief is if people using our product will one day move into a hearing aid absolutely because they're going to need assistance um, in all situations at all times of the day uh, but we're not that product and i think that's one of the things that needs to be i guess highlighted today is that uh you know we're we're, we're not competing with the hearing aid market in fact we're we're broadening the, the hearing market so it's not about hearing aids, hearables, or otherwise. It's about hearing. 
um, in totality. And uh, um, and that's exciting thing. And, um, you know, we, we do a good job of actually, uh, I guess, um, making sure people um, who do have a more profound level of hearing loss at the point of screening, we, we screen them out. Mm-hmm. So because we know our product's not suitable for them. And um, so I think, yeah, that they there should be, and I hopefully is, as as we grow, that there's there's more collaboration between hearables and, and hearing aids, and it just becomes hearing, because um, quite frankly, where hearing and hearing loss may be lost in what we now term personalization, and, and that's where technology is driving the market to personalization. Yeah, no, I agree, and it's quite interesting that you screen people out if if their hearing loss is too severe. So you you must get a lot of data analytics on your customers through through your app and and the cloud and and so on. Are there is there anything surprising that you found about your customer? Whether it's where they use their devices, how often, how many of them actually have a hearing loss? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got customers of you know age from eight to eighty, so we're, we're not necessarily you know, um, but it's it's hard to cater to all all. Yeah. All markets. Um, what we're trying to appeal to is that that middle market, as we suggested uh, earlier. But but data is an incredible. I mean, this is our third generation of product, and the millions of hours of data that we've got, um, and uh, and then we do collect uh, anonymously. Um, but that data, we're able to see patterns. Um, so we know, for example, someone that's 55 is using the speech processing twice as much as someone that's 45. Mm-hmm. Um, we've known, for mm-hmm. example, that home use because we have a number of different profiles on the product. So home use, uh, probably no surprise, but through COVID, home use has gone up exponentially. Plane use has dropped. Um, you know, restaurant has dropped. So getting that sort of valuable data is 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 incredible in terms of defining what your product roadmap is as well. Um, and, and that's allowing us to stay ahead of the game. And um, I think is probably something that's quite unique to the hearing market is, is the fact that we've got such a broad range of data across so many ages about how people are ultimately using their product. Right. What's what's been the toughest technology challenge that you've faced as you've you know progressed through your different product lines? Uh, I don't think we could have picked a harder harder battle than hearing to win on the technology front. I mean, there's an old saying: hearing's hard, and that's why very few do it. And and it's true. Um, it's it's you know it's why we you know now got a collaboration with, with HP because if you don't focus on it, you, you don't understand it. And and you would know, everyone's, everyone's ears are different. Um, so to try and develop a product that caters to a mass market that relies on deep levels of personalization is, is incredibly difficult. So from a t- technology standpoint, it's, it's, it's meeting that. And, you know, it's, it, it's if, if I was, it's akin to you know designing a car. I, I'm not designing a car to just get us around the block, right? In, in a nice on a nice sunny day. We're designing this car to go cross country through rain, hail, sleet, you know. Yeah. Um, and that that's the challenge is is designing not just the hearing tech, but the product and I guess the the market awareness that uh, these sorts of products exist and and are available to people. So. Technology is probably something we're comfortable with. Yeah. It's more the challenge of, of awareness and uh, um, and introducing this new category of smart hearing to to a broader marketplace. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you said how hard it is and, and the reasons why. And I want to ask you about Hewlett Packard in a second, if there's anything you can say. But it reminds me that um, uh, about five years ago, I was invited to speak at the wearable International Wearable Technologies Conference in Munich. Uh, and uh, I gave a talk on hearables. It was more than just, it was wearables, not hearables. But I basically said, you know, this is in, in, when a lot of companies were emerging. Braggy uh, was, uh, was a, a darling child. You had Doppler Labs coming out. You had a lot of these hearable companies emerging on Kickstarter and things like that. And I basically stood up and said, five years from now, 99% of these companies are going to be gone <laughs> because they're all focused on the easy bit, which is the signal processing. But yeah. the hard bit, is what hearing aid companies don't talk about. And that's the decades of work to get low power electronics to sound, you know, have clean sound, to be comfortable, have the battery last a long time, survive earwax, uh, rain, hairspray, all this stuff, which that's the hard part. And I think the comfort, 
you know, comfort and occlusion, I think, probably killed, you know, half the hearable companies out there. But, you know, you've survived. And I, I, and I really commend you on overcoming a lot of those challenges that others were not able to. Uh, thanks. And uh, yeah, it is, it, is, it is nice to have survived. And, uh, but they're absolutely key features of, of delivering um, a, a product is comfort, is occlusion. They're, they're all the things that we've, we've experienced and, and developed, I guess, counter strategies to over, over time to try and solve those issues. I think, you know, you, it, it's always difficult. You're never going to, I think, satisfy uh, uh, everyone. Um, that there's always going to be some, but you know we have uh, return rates in single digits. So, so from that perspective, I think we've at a third generation product. I think we're, you know, and from a hearing category, I think that's a, it's a, a really, really good result um, and, a, and an ultimate measure of, of whether you're actually appealing to your to your audience. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, um, it's nice to still be here. And I guess what we did well was pace ourselves at the rate of the wave. We always knew hearing wasn't going to change over a course of one or two years. This would take four or five years. I think I think you were you were on note there in uh, in in identifying that uh, you know you've got to have some steely resolve and um, to, to actually uh, you know push through what is now um, you know I what I think will be an even more broader market. I think there's there's a, there's a lot of changes uh, afoot uh, which is quite exciting. Yeah, no, I agree. Can, is there anything you can tell us about this partnership that you mentioned with Hewlett Packard, or is that confidential? Um, look, yeah, elements of it are, um, but I think you know the fact that you know, a, a big tent company has come all the way to Australia, um, uh, I guess, goes back to what we were talking about earlier, Brent, which was that hearing is hard, um, and it, and it is a specialisation. It's not something you can turn on um, tomorrow. It does take collaborations like you hear it does with now it does take a lot of other collaborations with with chip supplies and the like as well um, but it, it's just testament to the fact that uh, what we're seeing is is a connection of the years to a lot of different things now um, Hewlett Packard will have have their own needs um, which they'll announce in in due course but I think the years are, are, are connected to you know uh, and our need to be connected to different types of devices is is fueling um, that that collaboration, um, and uh, you know we're excited that uh, um, our our core technology, which is able to deliver levels of personalization, is is driving some of those relationships. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. But uh, I think there'll be there'll be more news about that as and when HP release that over over the coming months. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's great to hear. I'm very excited to see what what comes from that. And by the way, your your mention of single digit return rates, I think, would make a lot of companies out there uh, quite jealous. Well, I think I think it comes down to the way we sell it, and that, that's why I come back to it's not just about the widget; it's about how you sell it as well. And our, our direct to consumer model, screening out those that aren't suitable for the product. Um, this is where hearing aid companies shouldn't be nervous about what we're doing. In fact, they sh they should see that as potential referrals. Um, yeah. So th there's a lot of opportunity there for us to um, to uh, I think partner rather than butt heads with with the with the hearing aid market. That's for sure. Do you have many hearing healthcare professionals, including New Hera, in their offerings in addition to hearing aids, or are you you purely a, a retail distribution channel? Um, yeah, pretty much retail. So through our own direct to consumer offerings, um, yeah. we talked about no one go shopping for hearing. So you actually have to bring people through a whole hearing healthcare journey at a much earlier age. So introduce them, educate them, uh, yeah. bring them through to, to a transaction. Um, but what we've seen is a change in the way when we first came to market, you know, the Best Buys, the, you know, the Walgreens, the Brookstones, we, um, Harrods Virgin, everyone wanted hearing. Um, and uh, we thought, well, how good is this? Um, you know, hearing healthcare is, is, is going to penetrate the broader retail. But what we found is our growth was only coming through adding retailers. So we're getting the sell in, not the sell through. Mm. Um, and that's where it does take some expertise. And, uh, you know, we're, we're cognizant of that. Um, and uh, that's where we had to pivot back to a direct to consumer model where we could educate them through a consultative sales process. Um, and, uh, but having said that now, we've, we've developed hybrid models with these retailers where we're able to target their membership and customer bases online and bring them through in a whole online. So 
with them utilising our assets, um, bring them through a, a hearing healthcare journey, which is very difficult to do if you're relying on someone to walk into a store. Yeah, and you know, I, I've I've talked a lot with people, audiologists, about whether something like New Hero could be a good solution for those clients who come in, have a hearing loss uh, or mild hearing loss, but but walk out without a hearing aid for whatever reason. Either their hearing loss is too mild or they reject, uh, you know, the, the typical hearing aid uh, for stigma reasons or the costs or whatever. But, you know, I think uh, so far I haven't seen hearables in general really having much of an impact in, you know, hearing audiology clinics. And, and I'm wondering if it's because the, the demographic that goes into the clinic in the first place is simply is a different kind of person than someone who would be you know, uh, find your product online or in a store more appealing? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think, again, there are a number of factors that that, uh, that drive that as well. I think if people yeah. doing it online and have the product delivered in the comfort of their own home, um, ultimately can can do it in private. And I, I still think there is some stigma to it. Yeah. And, and just as an interesting aside there, so we did a pop-up in, in a shopping centre, right, where we offered to, to screen some people's hearing as a part of the process. Um, people, people wouldn't do it. People, people are really shy mm. about um, their hearing and doing anything about it in a public space. So, which is why I think the online aspect of it has worked as well, because it's allowed people um, the, the the convenience to to do this online, but but under the veil of some form of secrecy. So, I hope that changes, um, and I think it will over time as as we get more normalised on wearing things on the ear. Um, but yeah, it's so. As we've learned through time, it's it's just developing a hearing widget is one thing. Um, being able to get it into market to, you know, uh, a market that's not really looking for it um, yeah. ha has had some challenges. Absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, it reminds me that there have been a lot of companies in my career who have tried to develop hearing aid companies and failed because they thought it was just about the product and it's not. You know, it's really about the channel. It's about the the, the customer and and they're addressing their you needs in a differentiated way. I, I'm wondering, given what you what you said about people like like to do it themselves and maybe do some of this in their own home. Uh, how do you view the upcoming uh, OTC hearing aids in the U.S.? Is that is that a threat to your business, or do you see it as still different segments to your customer? Yeah, diff different segment, um, okay. and and for us that's a that's a sell up into into a hearing aid. So it's something that's probably designed to be less situational and more all wear day all day all day wear. Sorry. Um, so, but again, something probably then you know. So it, it's a broadening of the market. So hearing buds, uh, OTC hearing aids, and then more broadly speaking, you know, the, the traditional hearing aid market. So yeah, we see those different different uh, different category. It's it's one we're excited about. It's one that we're prepared for as much as yeah. we can be in not understanding the specifications that are available under OTC yet. Um, but I think it's it's an exciting development. I'm, it, I think there's more hype around um, the, the category rather than thought on how it's delivered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I, I know there's been a lot of noise about it and the specifications of the product, but I, I think uh, it'll take some time to develop as, as a category because I'm a, I'm a firm believer a hearing aid, whether an OTC, and we prove it as a hearing bud, won't sell on a peg in a store. Yeah. Ha there has to be some process behind it. So, um, you know, online, I think we've got some opportunity, but uh, in store, yeah, it's going to be going to be interesting. I, I don't know where that goes. Do you have any thoughts on how that how that how that works? Well, I, I think there's going to be a lot of companies who are lined up to take advantage of the OTC regulation, who are going to be in for a sore surprise when you know the the presumed 80 percent of the market waiting for their product doesn't show up mm -hmm. uh, for the exact reasons that you said. There, it's it just putting a hearing aid on a shelf isn't hardly going to induce anyone uh, to to pick it up. At the end of the day, it's it's healthcare, and most people want to see a healthcare professional. And there are people who want to do it themselves. And then you know, New Hera and other product categories, you know, will fit those. But I I like your perspective on that. OTC hearing aids is a different segment than than hearables, which is a different segment than traditional products, which is 
I'm assuming you'd say a different segment than uh, earbuds that don't have, you know, uh, speech enhancement or, or hearing compensation in there. So there, there are kind of segments within segments in the market. And, and that's how I've started thinking about this. I published a paper earlier this year on how I see all these technologies fitting into the different segments. And, and I really think that that's how, when we think about the future, that's how everything is going to, everyone's going to work together. They're just, they're not going to steal products from each other. And what was, if I, again, I think back to Doppler and Braggy and, and those, those companies, if you read what they were saying, it was all about hearing aid companies are idiots. They don't know what they're doing. We're going to take all of their customers away from them, which is the exact wrong thing to way to think about it. And so you, yours may be the only company that actually said, we're going after, you know, people who aren't currently being served. And you know the hearing aids have their own own place in the market. Yeah, absolutely. Which is you know there's an element of craziness in attempting to pursue that yeah. <laughs> as well. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to build a category, you're then building a product to sell into is 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 not the easiest thing to do. But um, but I 100% agree with you. I mean, the hearing aid companies serve a very valuable purpose, as do audiologists. But there is there is different ways. Patient centered care, um, this ability to get into hearing. Um, like I, I can self-assess in in any other form. If I've got pain relief or I've got, you know, some form of other health issue, more often than not, I can I can conduct some patient centered care. Like use use my own effort to drive that first level. Um, and hearing's never been really able to offer that. And that's where I see this opportunity through OTC, through hearables, through OTC and hearing aids, is that hearing just becomes a broader category. And yeah. if, if we get more people using products and and servicing their hearing at an earlier age. It's actually going to sell more hearing aids. That's yeah. my belief, um, well, and I know you agree with that as well. Your study actually pointed to that, right? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And you know, if you look at what happened a year ago and the exuberance, you know, uh, that that was seen in the market with their stock, it just shows you that people know that there's there's an untapped need out there. You look at like companies like Lively that are coming up with this blended model of service delivery. There's there's a, a there's room for all of those different approaches, and, and by the way, you've got an aging population that's growing and growing, so it's it's just gonna it, more and more people will be added to this this segment. So, I, you know, I think we hopefully we have some questions coming, and Cheyenne can tell us. But um, maybe one last question for you, from me, um, if you think about, you know, five years from now, ten years from now, what does the world of hearing look like? Wow. Uh, I My life is uh, chopped up into about three monthly intervals at the moment. Uh, so uh, uh, to, to look five years out is a, is a big, 10 years out, I, I have no idea. Um, five years out, um, look, I think, uh, from, at least from our perspective, from a hearables perspective, there's, there's, more nor there's more normality around wearing things on your ear. And I think we will work, uh, we'll all work in a hearing um, market, which is part of the technology market, which is delivering different levels of personalization through different devices, um, through different means, and in much the same way as we are today. So I don't, I don't see the structures changing necessarily. I just see more people utilizing personalization as a feature into, into, into hearing. So hopefully, you know, whilst hearing aids will always be there, we're not talking about the negative aspect. We're not talking about hearing loss. We're talking about hearing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we do a, a job today. And this is one thing I didn't anticipate, that we actually advertise ourselves now as not a hearing aid. Um, and I think that's pretty significant. You know, we're, 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 we're not trying to be a hearing aid, never have. Um, and we don't necessarily want to be regarded as a hearing aid because we're actually targeting a, an earlier audience. But um, I just think more broadly speaking, we'll, we'll all be here talking about hearing rather than different categories. Thank you so much for um, for that robust discussion. And um, knowing the two of you, you can go on for hours. <laughs> um, we do want to address some of the questions. We, we did have um, quite a few questions. Um, so first from Chris, um, what are your thoughts on hearables such as New Hera in meeting the global demand for <clears throat> hearing rehabilitation in low and middle income countries? where um, the demand for affordable quality hearing care solution is huge. Um, and how do you how do you see New Hero's role in meeting that gap? 
Whoa. Uh, do you want me to go first on <laughs> that one, Brent? Yes, please. Uh, look, that, that is a challenge, no no doubt. Um, the, the devices today are, are still, they're not the cheapest thing to produce, and they are a hearing device. So every device that comes off our production line actually, actually has to be tuned um, individually. Um, so as and when you can get into mass production, I think you can bring the cost of manufacture down and maybe, and scale goes up, then you can you can enter those particular parts of the market. So you know, when we're selling hopefully millions of units rather than tens of thousands of units, then that's obviously going to bring the cost of manufacture down dramatically and and hopefully be able to see us enter um, some of those uh, some of those markets. But uh, um, Brent, I don't know what what are your thoughts about how how we can drive into into the the, uh, the those sorts of countries. Yeah, so I agree with what you say in terms of the you know your cost of goods getting that down to be uh, successful in, in those other markets. But you know, I, I guess not may, maybe naively, but I would I would think that the concept of different segments applies no matter what country you're in. That you have some people who really need professional hearing health care. Um, now they may get a, a lower cost hearing aid. They may not get a, a hearing aid that has Bluetooth and you know uh, balance sensors and all that, but they'll get a they'll get something that meets their needs. You're going to have other people in that market uh, who don't need that, don't want it, and something like New Hero will be a lot more appealing. Whether you can get to their cost, their their cost point is a is another issue. But the I think people innately sort of have the same needs and and demands. And they're going to have to be treated differently by different product segments, uh, like we are doing, you know, in countries like Australia and the U.S. Yeah, and just to finish off on that as well, and particularly places like Africa, um, the, the emergence of the smart device, the phone, and the like, the computer completely bypassed those countries that went straight to to handhelds. And I think the interaction of of, of that device with a with a low cost uh, hearing aid, um, yeah, I think there's with the right uh, uh, technology um, could have some some pretty big impacts. Yeah, and so maybe one of the keys is distribution. How do you get hearing help in a country where there aren't many hearing care professionals? And so utilizing smartphone and self-fitting approaches is, is probably key there. Would agree, yeah. Yeah, so can you tell us a bit um, about the take up of hearables in um, in the hearing services program in Australia? Yeah, look, that that's an interesting one for for us because um, we're on the HSP. We're also on the NDIS because we um, we do have a lot of uh, people, particularly uh, younger, that that use it for treatment of background sound and promotion of speech. That uh, um, so for those that are on the autism spectrum and the like. So um, the HSP has been uh, not the easiest thing for us to to navigate as a hearables product. Um, Again, I think, and if I'm completely honest about this, that the HSP is 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 largely run and governed by audiologists. Um, and I think, you know, those people that go to the audiologists is more propensity for them to dispense a hearing aid rather than a hearable. So, so from that perspective, I, I don't necessarily changing. It, it won't change overnight, but it, it will change. And you know, our recent addition to NHS in the UK, both in the UK, Scotland, Northern Ireland, um, where they've created hearable categories as well, I think it's just it's just recognition that there's some slow change here and uh, OTC and the like. There, there'll be some regulation change that will support the category over time, but it's going to take some time. So, um, yeah, it hasn't, hasn't been massive for us. And Brent, are interested in your thoughts on perhaps why hearables haven't been uh, been able to penetrate on those um programs as well. You know, again, I, I kind of go back to my earlier comment, it might be a channel issue that the kind of people going into a clinic for HSP maybe don't aren't the aren't in the right mindset for what a typical new hero customer. Um, and and to be honest, the channel is, is probably less motivated to, you know, fit new heroes than they are traditional hearing aids. It's yeah. it's, it's not what the the clinicians are trained on uh, like they are with traditional hearing aids and you know, the uh, financial motivations aren't there either, perhaps. 
Yeah, and that also addresses um, Andrew's question about how do you see the regulatory situation playing out um, for hearing aids and hearables around the world because they know that, um, you know, in US there are multiple pathways. So the classic OTC, um, de novo, plus the unregulated personal sound amplification products. Um, and so um, they're interested in about what about the rest of the world? Is there a, a potential there? Brent, I got my thoughts, but maybe you want to go first on that one. So I didn't quite follow the whole question, but I'll, I'll say that, you know, in the US with the regulations there as they exist today, if you don't market yourself as being for hearing a solution for hearing loss, if the intended use isn't to compensate specifically for hearing loss, then then you know you're not you're not governed by the FDA. Things like 510Ks are not not relevant for you. Um, and as you said earlier, Justin, you don't call yourself a hearing aid. And you know, and but but again, different different technologies for different segments, and uh, and they'll create an OTC category which won't cover hearables uh, either. I don't think, but um, or or it might. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you've thought about that because OTC regulation is going to be for mild to moderate hearing losses only. Yes, uh, absolutely, and uh, and I think that's perfect for it. That's what it's designed to do. Mm. Um, anything more than that, I think you do need to see a specialist, which is which is the audiologist. So, Would you call we, yourself a hearing aid, though? Uh, from an OTC perspective, yeah. If we meet their spec, we we, we would be classified then as a, as a hearing aid. Whether we choose or not to, to call ourselves yourself. a hearing aid in yeah. that particular part of the market, but you could be a lot freer in talking about hearing loss per se. Right. Um, and uh, I, I guess that's the challenge. What you call yourself, uh, to me, is um, it, well, it's not irrelevant because we are the thing you have before you go to a hearing aid. So hearing bud is is highly relevant. Um, but uh, yeah, who who you serve is, um, is 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 more particular point. And the lines have been blurred in in the US. Let's be frank about that. Through OTC and now the delay in OTC, um, the lines have been blurred somewhat. But we're very careful about what we say and do around um, being, you know, hearing challenged and being a hearing bud and and and, uh, and being there as a as a device that's uh, that's specifically not a hearing aid. So, um, uh, but the US and perhaps Brent, you would like to talk about this as well. But the US seems to lead the way in terms of where regulation follows them for the rest of the world. Is that a fair? Their it's assessment? the biggest market in the world, so typically as things go there, the rest of the world tends to follow, for sure. Great, so uh, we'll probably finish off on a few more questions before we wrap up. Um, so a question um, for for new here, Justin, um, are you undertaking research or evidence-based studies to quantify the benefits of MAX in hearing health? Uh, yes, we are. Um, they're important, and uh, as I said, we've uh, we've done some of that with now, um, who've been a good partner of ours. But we've also undertaken uh, other uh, independent university studies as well into into that, um, and the data becomes uh, uh, a, a big part of that as well. So, um, so yeah, we're we're all about being evidence based, and uh, I think um, you know it's about having product in market as well, and and, and getting that that user feedback um, I think that's a critical part you know with 50 plus thousand devices now being worn every day um, you know we, we, we we're getting the feedback on on uh, on user acceptance and uh, and that at the end of the day is is evidence-based yeah perfect and um, also uh, there's a question on the, do you see T-Coil from Hearing Loss Association advocacy um, play a role in your product? Um, T-Coil is an interesting one Brent do you we were, were we talking about this the other day um, perhaps not um, I don't remember uh, but look T-Coil is about um, yeah we you know you could walk into a shop and broadly speaking, T-Coil, why, why does T-Coil have to actually just present to those with a hearing aid with a hearing loss? I mean, at the end of the day, it can actually connect to a lot of different things. So, um, you know, there, there's this opportunity for T-Coil to actually present to to people with good hearing. Um, you know, that, that that technology and what it's ultimately delivering, yeah, there's a, there's a real opportunity, I think, that goes beyond 
hearing loss, it, it talks to all things hearing and, and communication in, in certain environments. Um, I don't know what you think about T-Coil and the opportunity uh, where it goes. But well, you know, the, the I think for me the question is, will Bluetooth low energy you know, become ubiquitous enough in public places that it, it replaces uh, T coils. You know, it hasn't yet, uh, but it is it is now a standard that many devices, not just hearing aids, will communicate with. And um, I think it's a it's a given that at some point, you know, that's going to happen. Yeah. So if I, perhaps I'm I'm guessing from your perspective, it's a question of do you make the investment, uh, and also looking at your market segment. You know, is this is this a need for your customers? Uh, to have that solution? No, it's not. It's more broadly speaking about what what T-Call does and what it ultimately delivers. And I do yeah. agree with you. It's it's low energy Bluetooth. And yes, we are making the investment in in that platform. But, you know, there's a lot of talk about low energy Bluetooth at the moment. But the fact of the matter is, you know, even if we put it in our device, there's nothing to connect to today anyway that's going to um, create benefit for that. So, um, you know, so this, this will morph over time. Um, but I think it's an exciting prospect over the next 12 to 18 months, that's for sure. Great, so we're almost out of time, but before we wrap up, I would like to put our guest on the spot and um, say a, a few final words to our audience here today, because we're all uh, current and future creators and facilitators of those innovative um, hearing technology and delivering it to uh, benefit our clients. So. Um, also bring back to Brent's presentation at the, the wearables technology conference uh, where you talked about the convergence of hearables and hearing aids, OTC and all that. So what is the state right now and how do we best prep for it? Sorry, on the spot. How about I'll answer so we can leave the final word to Justin. <laughs> so, you know, there is a lot of convergence going on uh, and, you know, where, where it's all leading you know, I asked Justin about five years from now, and and you know, when I think about the future, maybe more than five years, I think about the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix, where everyone in the world is walking around with an earpiece all day long. It just it serves different needs for for different market segments. For some people, it's just about hearing text messages and and you know querying Google. For other people, it'll be speech enhancement as well, and maybe some cognitive benefit and maybe some balance benefit, um, but you know, it's a world where where everyone is comfortable with an ear level device, and we're not there yet with meeting that challenge. Uh, but in that world, then it's just that everyone's got something, and it's just a matter a matter of understanding the different unmet needs of the different markets to figure out how to design that product for them. Not everyone's going to wear the same thing. It's everyone has different needs, different solutions for different people. And that's for me, that's the future. And that's the mistake a lot of these companies that no longer exist have made that they don't recognize uh, that they really need to focus on, on on these different unmet needs of market segments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree um, with, with Brent in that regard. And and from, from our perspective, it's 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 a market of convergence and and that convergence, you know, from whether you it's about convergence, about listening, it's about hearing, it's about communication. So this convergence is is all happening, but it's also about collaboration. So to sit here and think that you can actually deliver complete solutions end to end now from a hearing perspective as, as a singular business without actually having collaborations with with other parties, um, either, either that's through market or technology or otherwise, is is I think where where a lot of people go wrong. And you know, our, our collaboration with NOW is is a significant one. Um, it's delivered. We can focus on where what we're good at. NOW can bring, you know, their expertise to the table. It's those sorts of collaborations. And even if I think about where HP bring, um, it's those sort of collaborations that I think will drive the hearing market uh, as we move forward. And uh, so, you know, we don't, um, we're not smart asses that think we're going to sit here and change the world and do it all off our own bat. Um, it, collaboration will be an important part of, of hearing um, and the creation of normalization in hearing over over the next few years. Great. And um, so, are we are we thinking of collaborating collaborating more <laughs> now when you hear us? I'm not sure if it's a question that you you want to answer, <laughs> but well, I'm sure that we will. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 
Great, thank you, thank you so much, and um, uh, looking forward to to more results um, from Nuhira and Nell, and more collaboration opportunities. So, on behalf of Nell Soundbites producers team, I would like to thank you, um, Brent and Justin, for our discussion today, and it's on it's an honour to have both of you on the panel. Thanks, Jayen. Really Thanks, terrific Sarah. talking to you, Justin. Yeah, great, Brent. Uh, it's been quite enjoyable. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.